Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where your location is. It's my pleasure to be with us today, and I'd like to thank the Smile Train, the West African College of Surgeons, and the Nigerian Association of Orthodontists for making this happen. This morning, I'll be talking about nasoalveolar molding for unilateral and bilateral cleft lip and palate, the clinical steps. This is my outline. I'll go through a brief introduction. Prof, excuse me, Prof. Could you share your screen, please? Oh, I'm sharing my screen. Sorry about that. This morning, I'll be talking about nasoalveolar molding for unilateral and bilateral cleft sleep and palate, the clinical steps. This is my outline. I'll go through a brief introduction. I'll talk about the goals of NAM in unilateral and bilateral cleft sleep and palate. I'll go through the instruments and materials needed for this procedure starting with the impression taking, the actual fabrication of the plates, both for the unilateral and bilateral cleft patients, and I would conclude. Next, alveolar molding is a technique of pre-surgically molding the alveolus, the lip and nose in infants born with cleft lip and palate. This is also called pre-surgical nasoalveolar molding and it's a non-surgical way to reshape the gums, lips, and nostrils with a past plastic plates in patients born with cleft lip and palate before the surgery. This procedure is applicable for both unilateral and bilateral cleft lip and palate patients. And these are photographs showing patients with unilateral cleft lip and palate and bilateral cleft lip and palate. So to repair the deformities encountered with unilateral and bilateral cleft lip and palate to obtain optimal aesthetics can be quite challenging. As orthodontists, we are very concerned about the aesthetic results of any form of treatment given to our patients. And that is, this is it's particularly challenging when you have a bilateral cleft of the lip and palate to be able to create an aesthetically acceptable correction of the columella and the deformed nasal cartilage can be quite challenging. So for both unilateral and bilateral cleft lip and palate, the goal is a naturally looking, a natural looking appearance. And this is particularly important because of the aesthetic obsession that is commonplace in the society. I'm sure we are all aware that we live in a society that it's appearance conscious. Everybody is taking selfies and because of that, everyone wants to look good. It could be quite challenging then to have an aesthetic defect in, an, in, a, in a society that is obsessed with your physical appearance. There are some psychosocial problems associated with clefts of the lip and palate, apart from the emotional turmoil in the neonatal period. This is usually a trying period for the parents of the child born with the cleft. Naturally, the arrival of a baby should be a time of joy, but when a baby is born with a cleft, it's possible that the family experiences some sadness, some guilt, some anger, and some fear. But beyond this immediate psychosocial problems, we know that the effects of the cleft on the appearance, speech, and hearing can be long lasting. And this can have effects on health and social integration. Studies have shown that when an individual has an abnormal facial appearance, it could be a social handicap. And this may operate against the psychosocial well-being of such an individual. For example, the individual can experience a poor self-esteem because of the effect of the abnormal appearance and sometimes what they experience is an unfavorable social response. That is the attitude of the society to the defect. For 
Patients with cleft, for instance, they may experience teasing, name calling from their peers and colleagues at school. Over the years, everybody has been concerned about the results of cleft lip and palate repair. And there has been some improvement with the adoption of an integrated and multidisciplinary approach. And what does this consist of? This consists of the pre-surgical management to improve the initial cleft deformity. There have been advances in the surgical techniques that have been used for managing patients with cleft lip and palate. And apart from that, there is also the post-operative management of the scar and maintenance of the reconstructed nasal shape. When we talk about the treatment goals for individuals with cleft lip and palate, we know that this goes beyond just repairing the cleft of the lip and the palate. But the first step is to repair the cleft of the lip and palate. But beyond that, we also want favorable outcomes in terms of speech, in terms of hearing, in terms of the dental occlusion. So because of this, it's, there are some important themes for achieving these goals that we all desire. And that is what I refer to as an integrated multidisciplinary approach, which sometimes is used interchangeably with an interdisciplinary care. But what is expected, what is the gold standard for the management of the cleft patients is actually an interdisciplinary management because this goes a little ahead of the multidisciplinary care we talk about where you have so many members of the cleft team ranging from the surgeon to the orthodontist, to the speech therapist, the nurse, the social worker, and of course the parents of the patients. But when you have a, an interdisciplinary care, what is distinct about it is that you have just a common treatment goal that everybody tries to achieve. So it's not as if the orthodontist has his own goals, the surgeon has his, his own goals, and we all try to pursue these goals separately. But we all work hand in hand to make sure that we achieve a single goal for this patient. So with this, we have team members, we should it's encouraged that patients with cleft lip and palate are managed by an interdisciplinary team where every member is trained and is as expertise in cleft care and above that also that a treatment protocol is being used for coordination of care. We know that care of these patients extends beyond the immediate neonatal period. There is usually continuation of care. So this requires coordination of this care. And we know the benefits of having a protocol so that the treatment of, occurs at the optimal time, the optimal techniques are used and there is no risk of over-treatment or under-treatment of the patient. So I will go, I would like to address that the pre-surgical management to improve the initial deformity. This is where the orthodontist comes in at the beginning of the care of the cleft patient. The pre-surgical infant orthopedics has been employed for a long time as an adjunctive neonatal therapy for correction of cleft lip and palate. This has been done for many, many years. And there have been arguments for and against this pre-surgical infant orthopedic procedures. But recently the paradigm has shifted from the traditional methods that were used and some newer methods have been employed trying to overcome the challenges that the previous methods had. And some of the problems encountered with the previous traditional methods was that it couldn't address the deformity of the nasal cartilage or the deficiency of the columella, which were important issues when we are talking about the aesthetic outcome of the cleft repair. The, I said that there have been various methods of pre-surgical infant orthopedics that have been used in the past. And I have a list here. This is not exhaustive, but these are just a few of the traditional methods that have been used. The head cup with extraoral appearance, the head cup with facial extensions, bandages over the prolabium, facial adhesive straps, compression bandages with head bonnets, rubber bands, elastic bands, and even 
wires have been tried, have been used in the past to try to reduce the initial deformity before the surgical management of the repair. But the modern era of pre-surgical orthodontic appliances can be attributed to McNeil, who tried using an intraoral acrylic appliance. And the appliances we have today are like modifications of what he actually started. So pre-surgical nasal alveolar molding is another approach to this traditional method of pre-surgical infant orthopedics. And that's what we'll be dwelling on today. It's been described by several people, by Grayson et al. in 1993, Breckett et al. in 1995, Grayson and Santiago 1997, and Cotton et al. in 1998. Nasal alveolar molding is performed by orthodontists in the first stage of the management of the orthodontic management of the cleft patient. We know when in for, for the orthodontic management of the cleft patient, it's usually divided into stages for, for clarity. We have the in stage at infancy, we have the late primary to early mixed dentition stages and all the various stages. Different people have categorized the stages in different ways, but I prefer this because it also follows the development of the, the stages of development of the teeth. So Grayson described nasal alveolar molding as a technique that uses acrylic nasal stems attached to the vestibular shield of an oral molding plate to mold the nasal cartilage and the alveolar region to normal form and position during the neonatal period. The objective of NAM is actually to actively mold and reposition the deformed nasal cartilage and the alveolar processes before the surgical repair, as well as lengthening the deficient columella. So what the nasal alveolar molding does is that it restores pre-surgically the skeletal, the cartilaginous, and the soft tissue relationships of a cleft slip and palate patient before the initial surgical repair. The key words are that it's done pre-surgically and it's a pre-surgical way of achieving this. This is the nasal alveolar molding plates for unilateral cleft lip and palate. And like I said, basically what it consists of is a plate with a nasal stent or a nasal prone or a nasal conformer for manipulating this tissue, the soft tissue, the hard tissue, before the surgical repair of the cleft. This is the, a photograph of the nasal alveolar molding plate for a patient with bilateral cleft slip and palate. And would notice that it has two nasal prongs and it also has the retention, retention sticks for use in patients with cleft, bilateral cleft slip and palate. To be able to understand what we are trying to achieve with nasal alveolar molding, it is important that, that we, quick, we run through the deformity that exists when the patient has both the unilateral and bilateral cleft lip and palate deformity. The unilateral, in the unilateral cleft lip and palate deformity, what happens is that the lower la lateral ala cartilage is depressed and, conca and concave in its rim and separated from the contralateral cartilage located high in the nasal tip. What happens also is that there is de depression and displacement of the nasal tip. There is an overhang of the nostril apex and the columella and nasal septums are inclined over the cleft with the base deviated towards the non-cleft side. This is what I was trying to describe. The lower lateral cartilage is depressed and concave in the ala rim and it's separated from the contralateral cartilage. The, there is an, oh, the tip of the nose is deviated. There is an overhanging of the nostril apex and then there's a deviation of the septum towards the non-cleft side and the columella. 
And this is the same thing being shown in the patient, the deviation of the columella and septum to the non-cleft side, the overhanging nostril apex, and then the depression of the cartilage. The deformity in bilateral cleft lip and palate deformity is a little different. What happens there is that we have depression of both the both nasal cartilages on the left and the right. Beyond that, the prolabial tissue has no muscle and it's attached to the shortened columella. And then the premaxilla is usually hanging detached from the alveolar segments behind the prolabium. The prolabium, like I said, the ala cartilages are stretched over the cleft in a flared fashion and the premaxilla is suspended from the tip of the nasal septum. This is what I was trying to describe in a cleft patient. There is hardly any columella. We have the prolabium. The deformity can be varied, particularly when there is bilateral cleft lip and palate. You can see that in this, in this patient, the columella is almost totally absent. And the deviation of the premaxilla is not only protruded, but it's rotated in this patient. We can see that the premaxilla is rotated and there is depression of both nasal cartilages. This is another patient where we have an extreme protrusion of both the prolabium and the premaxilla, and we can see that the alveolar segments appear collapsed behind the premaxilla. So what are the goals of nasoalveolar molding for both the unilateral and bilateral cleft lip and palate patients? In unilateral cleft lip and palate, it's to align and approximate the intraoral alveolar segments that we saw were discontinuous. We want to correct the malposition of the nasal cartilage corrects the nasal tip and the ala base that is usually deviated to the non-cleft side, and then corrects the position of the columella and the philtrum, that is bring them back to the mid-sagittal plane. The goal in, this of, in bilateral cleft lip and palate patients is first is to lengthen the columella because we find that in patients with bilateral cleft lip and palate, the columella is almost totally absent. It's very, it's short. And then the apex of the nasal cartilages, they are failed to migrate into the nasal tip at, and the no nostril is usually flat. Apart from that in bilateral cleft lip and palate too, we'll, the goal is to align the alveolar segments. We saw from the photographs of the cleft patients that the premaxilla many times is displaced, is protruded forward, sometimes is rotated, and it's hanging far ahead of the alveolar segments. So the goal in bilateral cleft lip and palate nasal alveolar molding is to bring these segments together so that we are able to achieve a seemingly continuous arch, maxillary arch, before the surgical repair. Why is nasal alveolar molding possible? But what is the rationale for nasal alveolar molding? And this nasal alveolar molding takes advantage of the malleability of immature cartilage in this immediate neonatal period when a baby is born. Apart from the cartilage being malleable, it has the ability to maintain a permanent correction of its form. And the neonatal cartilage is very, very plastic in the immediate neonatal period. The reason for this plasticity is believed to be caused by high levels of hyaluronic acid, a component of a proteoglycan intercellular matrix, which is found circulating in the infant for several weeks after birth. Studies have found that when a child is born, that there is this plasticity of the tissues, particularly the cartilaginous tissues. And it's been understood that it is the presence of the maternal estrogen that increases the level of the hyaluronic acid, which is responsible for the plasticity of the cartilage. 
Studies have also shown that beyond the cartilage, the plasticity of even the soft tissues, the tissues of the lips, is very much increased in this immediate neonatal period. And so because of that, nasal alveolar molding is carried out in the first three to four months of life when the tissues are still very plastic and they are moldable, just like you can mold plasticine. I think this method has been used even traditionally in our local settings where parents felt that even the head of, heads of infants and the various parts of the body could be molded by gently massaging them in the immediate period of birth. So to go to the nasal alveolar molding procedure itself, the, we have a number of instruments and materials that are necessary for nasal alveolar molding, like our pliers, various types of pliers, the Adams plier, the loof forming plier, the heavy wire cutter, infant impression trays, impression material. Various studies, various people have proposed the use of both elastomeric impression material and alginate, clear self-cure acrylic resin, 0.36, M, 0.36 inch stainless steel wire or 0.8 mm or 0.9 mm can be used. Soft tissue relining material, we use Durabase by Reliance. Denture adhesive, retention sticks with grooves, micropore tape, Duodam, which is a skin protecting tape or tincture of benzoin. I would explain what that is used for. And orthodontic elastics, these are some of the materials that are used. These are the hand instruments that we use, what, the basic hand instruments that are required for nasoalveolar molding. These are infant impression trays. And these trays were fabricated by our technologist himself. The initial impressions for these cleft patients were taken without any tray. I used my fingers to take, gloved fingers to take the initial impression. And from this impression, these trays were fabricated. And subsequently, as we have patients, we make new sets of trays. So we make trays in various sizes and from acrylic resin and perforate them for to aid retention. And these trays we discard it intermittently and make another set. We make in various sizes because sometimes the cleft is wide, sometimes it's so little so that we can choose the appropriate size tray for the infants. So for, this is the impression material. We always use elastomeric impression material. This is the soft tissue relining material, Durabase by Reliance, which we use. These are the retention sticks that we use for the gracings method. And this is made from acrylic resin. There should be about 10 to 15 millimeters in length and a diameter of five millimeters. What we do is that we use an NG tube for the fabrication of these retention groups. We just pour the soft acrylic resin into the NG tube and then when it sets, we cut them into the bits we need and make the grooves with a ball. This is, this is the micro pore tape and we use two different types. We have the transparent transport, which is almost transparent and it's almost invisible when you use them on the patient's skin. We use this made by 3M and this is the denture adhesive that we use. So to start the clinical steps, the first time a patient comes into the clinic at the first visit, we usually reassure the parents. I already talked about the fact that this is a, an interdisciplinary or an integrated. We are all working together to ensure that the patient gets the best. So we're also involved with reassuring the patients, the parents, reinforcing feeding instructions, which are usually with the, with them, which is usually a nursing care. We are showing the patients we have the psychologists, the social workers, but we also lend a voice to that. And for both the unilateral and bilateral cleft tip and palate, on the first visit, we want to make an impression 
of the intraoral cleft defect. And after making that impression, the other thing to do is to tape the lips of the patient. If our patients, it's not common here to have prenatal diagnosis of the cleft lip and palate, but out where they have prenatal diagnosis, the parents are already prepared for the arrival of the cleft baby, and they could have been referred to the team even before the arrival of the baby. But here, when the, parent, when the patient is born, usually within the first few days of life, we see infants from the second day of birth, sometimes the very first day they get referred to us for management. And like I said, we use the infant impression traits, uh, trays, and then we use the elastomeric impression material. Sometimes the infants are so small that what we just require is just about half of the scoop to make the impressions. Making the impression of the intraoral cleft defects can be a little tricky, but as you do it with time, you get used to it. We usually take the impressions with the baby fully awake and we usually do not want the baby to have had any meal before taking the impression, usually for about one, two hours before taking the impression so that we don't stand so much risk of regurgitation. But sometimes this may not be possible and then we go ahead to take the impressions as carefully as possible. Various people have advocated various positions for taking the impressions. For example, Grayson describes the head down position. The baby is actually positioned head, head down. People have described the supine position, the prone position for taking the impressions. But for me, I am more comfortable taking the impression with the baby seated in the mother's arm at a 45 degree position, just the way we advise parents to feed their patients. There are also varied opinions about whether this impression should be taken in the outpatient or hospital settings, but we take our impression in the outpatient clinic. The advantage of the hospital setting is so that any emergencies can be quickly attended to. But fortunately, we've never had any emergency with taking our impressions. But what is important with taking the impressions is the attention to the airway of the patient. And usually while we are taking the impression, you want to depress the tongue of the patient while you're taking the impression. And it is, a, it is an advantage for the baby to cry while you're taking the impression because that's where you are sure that the airway is patent and open while you're taking the impression. Because we use an elastomeric impression material, it sets quickly, although you could adjust your mix depending on how you want it to set. So usually it doesn't take so much time before it sets and you're able to withdraw the impression from the baby's mouth. If it is a bilateral cleft lip and palate case, then sometimes you may need to make sure that the impression material is a little soft. so that you're able to take the impression of the pre-maxillary segments without any problem. This is an impression of an intraoral cleft defect. Unfortunately, I don't have any photographs of taking the impression of the patient, of any patient, because we, I didn't get any patients around now, and I wanted to use my own photographs. So after the impression is taken, because it's the elastomeric impression material we use, you need to clean the infant's mouth thoroughly. I also want, was going to mention that while you're taking the impression and depressing the baby's tongue, it is also an advantage to have a suction machine so that you can suck out any secretions or any other thing that may be present in the baby's mouth. 
you clean the infant's mouth thoroughly to make sure that there is no bit of the impression material left in the patient's mouth so that they don't aspirate it. And next, you need to teach the patient parents how to tape the lips. For the unilateral cleft lip and palate patient, you tape from the non-cleft side to the cleft side. And lip taping should be done all through the day, 24 hours. You don't you change the tape once in a day, except the taping is loose. This is to prevent a situation where you keep traumatizing the patient's skin as you're removing and putting back the tape. And when you need to remove the tape, you will usually you wet it thoroughly and you avoid taping at the same spot just to prevent abrasion to the skin. Like I said, duodenum is a skin protecting material and it's, you can put it on the skin of the patient over which you now put your tape. Or if you don't have that, you can paint tincture of benzoin on the cheeks of the patient and once it sets, you can go ahead to tape over it. This is a baby with a unilateral cleft lip and palate. And this is the baby after the lips have been taped. This is the transport tape that I mentioned. And when you use the transport tape, it's almost invisible. And parents like this because one of the greatest challenges during this period is the embarrassment they feel. This is the Jordan dressing. The embarrassment they feel because people are asking what went wrong with the baby and so on. So from the impression that is made, dental casts are made from dental stone. And this is the impression for you, the, the cast for a unilateral cleft lip and the cast for a bilateral cleft lip and palate. After the impressions have been cast in stone, you need to do some Between the first and next visit, a numb plate is fabricated using clear acrylic resin. And usually for the unilateral cleft lip and palate patients, I'll be describing the modification of the Figueroa's method. And the stainless steel wire is embedded in the plate at, from the laboratory. For the unilateral cleft lip and palate, we have a single wire and for the bilateral, the wire is double. And the numb plate is completed and delivered at the patient's next visit. This is an alveolar molding plate ready for unilateral cleft lip and palate. The plate is fabricated and polished properly before the arrival of the patient. It's the same step for both the unilateral and bilateral cleft lip and palate. After taking the impressions, the cast is made and the plate is made ahead of the patient's next visit. So if you take an impression on about the third day of life, we expect the patient to come back at about one week for the delivery of the plate. This is the, the materials I had spoken about on my table, and this is the NAM plate fabrication. For the unilateral cleft lip and palate, the modified figures method is what I'm describing. The first step is to wax oh, up. Excuse me, Prof. So you have uh, we well, have start rounding up about five minutes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. You need to wax up the defect, and this is the plates made after the defect has been waxed up. The reason why you wax up the defect is to avoid a situation where you have acrylic flowing in between the defects of the, uh, the alveolar defects so that you don't have a bulge in between the defects. So when the patient arrives, you check the plates, 
you remove any sharp edges and you place the plate in the infant's mouth. The first step to fabricating the plates is to mark the wire 10 millimeters away from the upper lip and bend it upwards at an 80 degree angle as close to the mesial dome as possible. You mark the wire. I'm doing this in the laboratory because I don't have a patient to, to demonstrate with. Mark the wire about 10 millimeters away from the lip and then you bend the wire 80 degrees upwards extraorally. That is what I have done. The next step is to mark the wire again as high as the mesial nasal dome because the wire is going to go into the patient's nose. So you mark the wire as high as the mesial nasal dome and then make a second bend towards the outer surface of the nose. And when you have made the second bend, you mark the wire about 10 millimeters away from the outer surface of the nasal dome. The reason is that you want the nasal prong to go inside the patient's nose. After you have made that mark, you make a loop with a plier. After making the loop, you cut the wire with a heavy wire cutter and you close the loop. The aim is to have about two millimeters of this loop go into the baby's nose while the rest is outside. And so you can try the plates in the baby's nose. And the next step is to cover the loop with acrylic resin to make a bulb that goes into the patient's nose. I used durabase soft tissue reline in this presentation, but usually the bulb should be made with clear acrylic resin as well. You could now put a layer of soft denture relining material over it so that it is gentle on the infant's nose. And this is how you cover the loop with acrylic resin to make a bulb. You try to make it as fluid as possible so that there is no need to trim the bulb. This is the durabase material that we use for relining. It's the soft cushion rebase material. And the next step after fabricating the nasal prong is to rebase the appliance. These are the modifications that Figaro introduced into the nasal alveolar molding process. He introduced using a piece of wire for the nasal prong and then relining the alveolar ridge area for better retention. So you mix the dura base and then put in the alveolar ridge area and then you reline the plates by putting it back in the infant's mouth. And after relining, you put in hot water and then you use the denture adhesive to hold the plates in place. You put a little bit of denture adhesive on the surface of the plates and then you spread it on the plate before inserting into the patient's mouth. For the delivery of the molding plate, all these steps are done in a few minutes while the patient is by the, is on the seat by the side of the patient. And then you need to teach the parents how to insert and remove the plates. When the nasal prone is properly inserted in the nostril, you should see temporary blanching of the tissues overlying the nasal prong when, the, when this extension goes into the patient's nose. This will show you that it's applying enough pressure to lift up the nasal cartilage. And then at delivery, you now need to give the instructions about wearing the plates. The plates needs to be in the patient's mouth for 24 hours in a day. It needs to be cleaned once in the morning so that the denture adhesive is removed. The baby's mouth also needs to be clean so that you remove every remnant of the denture adhesive. It is normal that the baby will cry at the beginning, but with time they usually adapt to the plates. And one of the ways to identify patients who have been complying with the use is that when the patients come in, the babies are wearing the plates and the babies usually would not be crying when the plate is inserted. The patients need to make many visits to the clinic until the surgery is done because weekly adjustments need to be made both to the plate and to the nasal prone over the weeks. This is a baby with unilateral cleft lip and palate. The lip is taped first before the insertion of the appliance into the baby's nose. And like I said, we, we want a portion of the, of the bulb of the nasal prone to go into the patient's nose while a portion of it is outside the baby's nose. 
sometimes it's a little tricky. And even when you have placed the appliance in the baby's nose, you find out that the nasal prong is being pushed outwards. It's being displaced because of the pressure from the nose. So sometimes you need to use a small piece of tape to secure the bulb in the patient's nostril. This is a patient at the end of the molding. And this, uh, this is a cast of a patient. Usually it's expensive to take repeated casts. This was just about two weeks in, up into treatment and we can see a reduction in the defects of the alveolar. I have a video here, which I'll just play for a few minutes because of our time, just to demonstrate the procedure. That's like trying the plate in the patient's mouth, like I said, making the term MM mark just outside the patient's lip. Then you make the first bend 80 degrees upwards. This is a patient with unilateral, a plate for unilateral cleft lip and palate. You make a bend upwards. You mark the wire as high as the Missile nasal dome. And then make another bend mark the wire 10 millimeters away from the ex nose extraorally and from that point you make the loop This video is available on the slides and will be shared with us so we can watch it to the end. I'd like to run quickly through the bilateral nasal alveolar molding, the great modified gracings technique. The basic procedures are the same. The first visit, the impression taking, the lip taping. The lip taping is a little different for bilateral cleft lip and palate patients because here you are not using just a single tape to bring the lip segment together. You are using six tapes, two long tapes, five millimeters, and then four short tapes. And what you do is to bring all the three pieces of the lip segment together in bilateral cleft lip and palate, and then put the tape over it, the five millimeter CM tape, and then double it up. And then at the sides of the patient's nose, you put the tapes again to reinforce the tapes to hold the lips together because it's not only the plates that contributes to the molding the pressure from the taped lips in conjunction with the plates gives the orthopedic effect on the alveolar segment so that it comes together this is a dental cast made from impression made from the impression and for the bilateral cleft lip and palate patients we have two nasal prongs which are so we have stainless steel wires. For the bilateral case, we prefer to use 0.8 mm stainless steel wire. Two of them inserted into the plate. And we try to bring them as close together as possible so that they, they are not too wide and we don't cause widening of the columella. The first step with bilateral cleft lip and palate is to reline with Dura-Base soft cushion with base. We reline the plate, this is the first step. And then you put the plate in hot water to allow it to cure. If there is excess tura base around it, this needs to be trimmed. And then for the bilateral 
cleft lip and palate patient, that is where you need to put sequential addition of acrylic and trimming to get the plate to mold the alveolus and the premaxillary segment. What we are trying to achieve is to push the premaxillary segment backwards. So we'll be putting layers of soft resin on the anterior border and at the same time removing resin on the posterior border of the premaxilla to allow the to allow it to go to move backwards. This is also a video showing the procedure, but we can watch that later too. This is a video showing the steps from relining to the trimming process, the sequential addition and trimming of the appliance. It's available for us. We can watch it later. So the fabrication of the nasal prong for the modified gracing technique goes through the same steps as for the unilateral cleft lip and palate. The original design of gracing was to use acrylic as the nasal prong or the nasal stent. But with this modification, you use a piece of wire which just carries a bulb and you mark the wire just outside of the skin surface in this patient because usually there is already a protrusion of the premaxilla and then you bend the wire upwards at a 90 degree angle. After bending it upwards, you mark it at the inner surface of the nostrils, just like for the unilateral. You mark it at the level of the nasal dome and then you make another 90 degree bend inwards towards the plate. Just inside the maxillary plates, you make your markings and make your bulb, your loop, just as we made for the unilateral cleft lip and palate, from which you are make nasal resin balls that go into the patient's nose. The bilateral is a little more tricky because you need to be as symmetrical as possible on both sides. These are the retention grooves that you need to use to apply traction to the pre maxillary segments. When the, the nasal prongs are made, you make markings on the plates to which you attach, attach the retention sticks for the pre-maxillary traction with acrylic resin. Usually this is attached based on the opposition of the upper and lower lip. People advocate that maybe at an, at an angle of 20 degrees to the horizontal, but what you need to do is to make sure that it's able to stand in between the upper and lower lips of the patient. So for the tape elastic system, like I said, you usually use... No. Uh, time is because we still want to take questions. We understand you. Thank you. So you need to hold the appliance in place with denture adhesive. The elastics are applied to the cheeks. The premaxilla is retracted in conjunction with the micro tape. This is a tape elastic system. You use our usual elastic tapes, and then you are you hitch them to the orthodontic elastics. And these elastics are attached to the retention groups to retract the patient's premaxilla after taping. This is a patient with the appliance in place. He didn't have the nasal points. These are the unilateral plates for both the unilateral and bilateral. Like I said, you do sequential trimming and addition until you are able to achieve the objective of aligning the pre-maxilla, the lip segments, and the extension, increasing the length of the columella at the end of treatment. These are photographs of some of our patients during treatment and after treatment. But like I mentioned earlier, that beyond the molding and beyond the, the surgical techniques, the, the surgical technique is also critical. And there is an advocation for gingivoperioplasty alongside and then when the nasal surgery is being done the tissue planes also need to be opened and the fibrous tissue between the nasal bones removed and the nose nasal domes advanced before uh, during the surgery the NAM has its advantages and disadvantages and of course the complications of the procedure but one by mention that maintenance of the reconstructed nose is also critical so after the procedure is done, you need to 
avoid distortion and optimize your results by using nostril retainers. One brand is Nostop, which is used for about six to eight months, which is inserted into the baby's nose, which is cleaned every, twice daily to maintain the symmetry. I think one of the greatest keys to the success of NAM is the cooperation and compliance of the parents, because that is what appears to be most critical. But I'll conclude by, because if the patients don't use the plates, you're unable to achieve anything in this immediate period when the tissues of the baby is still very plastic and malleable. So I'll conclude by saying that interaction and consultation between the various specialties is very important while managing a patient with bilateral or unilateral cleft sleep palate because you're able to understand what are the possibilities with each discipline and the limitations. Certainly the pre-surgical reduction in hard and soft tissue deformity reduces the magnitude of the surgical challenge and in combination with the appropriate surgical skills, nasoalveolar molding is and post-operative management of the scars, the nasoalveolar molding can improve greatly the aesthetic outcome of unilateral and bilateral cleft lip and palate repair. I have a few references here which are specific to the initial techniques. I would like to acknowledge the assistance of Dr. Bisi Adesun Loye who took the photographs I used and made the videos. I'd also like to acknowledge the Smile Train Order of Craniofacial Foundation, OAUTHC, my colleague, and Department of Craniofacial Orthodontics at the Changchong Memorial Hospital, Taipei, Taiwan. Thank you for your attention. Sorry it took a while because this is actually a workshop that goes over days that I've tried to put into a 45 minutes presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Palawale, for the very detailed and educative presentation. I'm sure everybody would agree with me that we've all learned, learned quite a lot. I personally have learned a lot. So at this stage, um, we have a number of questions on the chat, on the chat box. So I will read out. Um, the first question is in is in French. Maybe Nicole can help us to translate the question for Professor Palawali. Yes, sure. The question is: Do these devices hurt when they are put in place? If so, how is the pain managed during and after the procedure? Thank you for that question. The devices should not hurt. Because the, the first step I mentioned is when the plate is fabricated, before you insert into the patient's mouth, you need to make sure that there are no rough areas. Those are the things that can make it hurt or extend over extension. So the margins are properly trimmed. It's included in the video, trimming the margins of the plates properly and you avoid over extension because the baby cannot speak to tell you where it hurts. But sometimes when you have still made the plates and there are areas of roughness that may cause irritation to the baby. You can see it at the subsequent visits as areas of hyperemia, but that doesn't happen often because usually the edges are well trimmed. And I also mentioned that the nasal bulb, you avoid trimming the nasal bulb. If you look at the video as you are trying to build up the nasal bulb, you, what you try to do is to rotate the plates as you are trying to build up so that you do not trim the bulb at all to affect, to avoid hurting the patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the, the next question here says that, how do you access the materials you use for the PNAM? Well, all the materials we've used so far, we got, I, I got them from Taiwan, but many of, some of these materials we can have substitutes for them. For instance, when our danger adhesive got exhausted, I got another brand, which I think is even available. The danger adhesive is an off-the-counter thing abroad. So I got one that is locally available here. But most of the materials that we started with initially, we got from Taiwan. But for, for example, the danger um, relining material, there are various danger relining materials that are used in other units of dentistry that can be substituted. They don't have to be this particular brand. Um, another question here says, what is the ideal age for orthopedic treatments? 
Okay, I guess the question is about this NAM therapy. Hmm. We usually start in the first week of life. I mentioned that we take the impression when the baby is about three days old, depending on when they present, and then we try to deliver the plates within a week. But sometimes if we see a baby on Monday, we try to deliver the plates before Friday so that the baby gets used to it in this immediate neonatal period and the compliance is better. Okay. What is the average duration of use for the NAM appliance amongst the patients? It's usually about three to four months before the primary repair. But like we had some delays during the COVID lockdown, so some patients just kept on using the appliance until elective procedures resumed. Another question here says, thanks for the beautiful presentation. Ma. Is it every patient with cleft hip and palate that will require the NAM appliance? Well, thank you for that question. When there are some cleft patients, if the cleft is not complete, if there is no deformity of the nostril, if the alveolar segments are together, you may say they do not require NAM, but for almost every patient, I think there is a benefit of taping the lips together. So I think almost every patient may require, if, even if it's not the plate, taping of the lips together so that the lip segments come together before the primary repair is done. Um, there's, Nicole, please, can you help me with the last question there from Ruzadi Kabuya? It, it's in French. Yes, sure. Uh, the question in French is, quelle est la filière et combien prend le temps pour former quelqu'un en orthodontie? What is the pathway and how long does it take to train someone in orthodontics? Oh, wow. <laughs> I guess that question is not about now. It depends on where exactly this person is referring to. In Nigeria, to train as an orthodontist right now is usually through either the National Postgraduate Medical College or the West African College of Surgeons. As it is a fellowship training that takes about six years, junior and senior residency training to obtain the fellowship of the West African College of Surgeons or the National College. But abroad, I know there are, there are master's programs, for example, in the UK, but even in the US, I think it's a residency training that is most popular for training as an orthodontist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kalawale. Um, I just want to ask one final question. I know we've run out of time, but is there any specific, apart from patient compliance, what um, specific challenge will you identify as, as being one of the difficulties in delivering the number of plans to your patients at your center? apart from patient compliance, which you rightly highlighted as the most important factor, you know, for success with compliance. Okay, um, thank you for that question. Majorly, the greatest challenge we have is procuring materials when we run out of materials. And the other issue, the other challenge we may have sometimes is the challenges with the lab because it's not every material that we buy specifically for the NAMA plant. Sometimes there are problems with the lab, there is no stone and all those kind of bottlenecks with the hospital. But apart from that, we just need the surgeons to be maybe more inclined towards this treatment. We have a lot of surgeons cooperating with us here in IFE, but I'm just talking about generally, to be more open to see what we're able to do with Mr. Alveola molding and check the outcome with their patients. Thank you very, very much, Professor Falawe. We have all learned a lot, and I'm sure everybody would agree with me that it has been a very educative and enlightening session. We're very oh, grateful yeah. to you. A, a question by Dr. Rebe Shalai. Oh, is there a question? Sorry? Okay, please go ahead. I, 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 I must have missed that. I was asking, okay. what sleeping position do you advise when these babies wear the NAM appliance? Usually we advise that they sleep with the side. And in the immediate period, we usually advise that the parents pay a lot of attention to them when they are asleep to make sure that the appliance is well inserted. But we advise that they sleep on their side. Okay. I don't know if we have any other questions. I want to be sure I haven't missed anyone's questions, but I believe that should be the final question. So 
Professor Kalawali, once again, we want to say thank you for the very brilliant presentation this morning and a very educative one as well. We are all very grateful to you on behalf of the Nigerian Association of Orthodontists and also Smile Train. We say thank you. We also say thank you to everyone who has attended this morning's session and who has been involved in planning and coordinating the session. We look forward to joining, having everyone join us again next week for our next session. Thank you very much.